actually in the city of Ephesus, it made such an impact that at the entrance to the harbor there were four great pillars. And they have the cross. Only one stands today. It has the cross on it. And one was to Matthew, one to Mark, one to Luke, and one to John. You see that after Paul and after John, there was a tremendous Christian population in that area. And even Dr. Luke could write concerning that area that all in Asia, both Jew and Gentile, heard the gospel. And there could have been upwards of 25 millions of people in that area. Here is the place where the Roman emperors came. It was a great resort area. And here is the place, as we've said, where east is east and west is west. And the twain did meet there. And it formed a great civilization. And here is where Paul had, I suppose, his greatest ministry was in the city of Ephesus. And out from there, the gospel was sounded forth throughout all of Asia, Dr. Luke says, so that all heard it, both Jew and Greek. Now, not all turned to Christ, but everyone heard it. That was probably the greatest movement and the greatest, what we would call, revival that has taken place in the history of the church. It took place in that particular area. Now, I want us to get into this message and into this letter that he writes to Ephesus. And I want to say just another word about this city. It was a beautiful city. When Paul landed at the harbor, there was that great harbor boulevard, white marble, and it's there today. And on each side, there were all sorts of lovely buildings, temples, and also certain shops that they had there, gift shops, I guess the ladies would call them today. There was a great market on the right as he went up, and then ahead of him on the side of the mountain was this great amphitheater. Not really the amphitheater, but this great theater that seated 20,000. Way off to the left of him was the amphitheater that seated over 100,000 people. At times, probably as many as a million to two million people gathered in Ephesus. Here is where Paul had his greatest ministry, and here is where John later became pastor. Now, the city was first formed around the temple of Diana by the Anatolians, and they worshipped Diana of the Ephesians. And the temple at first was a wooden structure. It was built at the very beginning on a very low place, right by the side of the ocean. The harbor came right up there. But in time, the Cesta and the Little Meander River, I have never in my life seen a country that washes as much as that Meander Valley washes. I tell you, the river itself is like soup. It's not just water, it's soup. It's carrying down so much deposit. And it soon filled in around the temple by the time of Alexander the great, the night he was born, that temple burned. And when he came there and took the city, he turned it over to one of his generals, Lysimachus. And Lysimachus there attempted to move the people away from there because already the silt was coming in, the harbor was filling up, and they had to move farther down, and he moved them to higher ground. And that's where you see the ruins of that city today. It's the city that was there when Paul came there. Then on the ruins of where the old temple was, they put down charcoal and skins. It was a very low place. They built the temple of Diana. It became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built, as we said, on an artificial foundation of skins and charcoal. It was to make it actually earthquake-proof, and it was built on a marsh that was there. The doors of it were of carved cypress wood. The staircase was carved out of one vine from cypress. It was a regular art gallery with the masterpieces of Praxiteles, Phidias, Scopus, Polycletus, and Apelles' famous painting of Alexander the Great was there. But behind the purple curtain 
was that awful shrine, the most sacred idol of heathenism, Diana, the many-breasted one. And it was the largest Greek temple ever built, 418 feet 1 inch by 239 feet 4 and a half inches. There were 100 external columns, and there is some difference of opinion, of course, about the exact size of it. But it was four times larger than the Parthenon, and it was finally destroyed by the Goths in 256 A.D. So that this great temple that was there in Paul's day and around it, the grossest immorality was performed. Because when you move farther inland, it becomes nothing in the world but sex orgies, and her name is changed from Diana to Sybil. Now, this gives you some conception of this place. And if you want to know how wonderful that temple was, that is, as far as the physical beauty was concerned, if you ever go to Istanbul, go to Hagia Sophia. And those beautiful green columns that are there were taken out of the temple of Diana by Justinian when he built Hagia Sophia. And actually, this temple was really a thing of beauty. The temple of Artemis are of Diana. And she was the oriental goddess of fertility, the many-breasted one. She had a trident in one hand and a club in the other. And it was a crude image that stood in the temple. And it was worshipped by probably more people than any other form of idolatry. The worshipers here indulged in, I suppose, the basis religious rites of sensuality. The wildest bacchanalian orgies took place, excessive and vicious. It would make some of the present-day new morality look like a Sunday school picnic. Now, Paul came here, you will recall, on his third missionary journey to begin his ministry. And for two years in the school of Tyrannus, the word went out. And it was a great door and effectual that was open unto him. But there were many adversaries. And John, the apostle of love, the son of thunder, he came as a pastor. He was exiled. And then after about 10 years of being exiled and in prison, he returned to Ephesus and he's buried at the Basilica of St. John that is on the highest point there. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to this church in the midst of crass materialism, degraded animalism, base paganism, and dark heathenism. And will you listen to him as he speaks to this church? Because, very frankly, I think this is one of the most important of all. Will you notice what he says? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Do you notice that he holds with his hands the church? It's under his control. He doesn't have it today, but he did then. And he walks up and down. I think he's still walking up and down and still judging his church. And you're seeing him do that. Now he has here seven words of commendation that he says to this church. He says, I know your works. We need to understand that he's speaking to believers. God is not asking the lost world for works. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy that he saved us by the washing of regeneration. This is the thing that is important. Paul says in Romans Four, five, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, Christ is talking to his own here. After they're saved, he wants to talk to you about good works. And he has a lot to say about good works. We are told, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk into him. 